Welcome to the um, course on um, optical spectroscopy and microscopy. Um, in the last lecture what we have seen is that how Fermi's golden rule um, uh, relates the rate of transition that you observe to the atomic prop I mean the, the properties of the system, properties of the chromophore uh, that you have taken in terms of the matrix element, um, <coughs> the perturbation and uh, so on and so forth. So, briefly the Fermi's golden rule um, is given by the rate of transition, we will start from there, is, uh, um, is equal to a bunch of constants, let us call that as some uh, k and we introduce the term rkg more or less rkg square and <coughs> of which uh, and then density of the state omega k I mean uh, rho kg. Now, in in the k, so for uh, what we are going to do now is to say that okay, this is what I know in terms of the how the system is going to respond for me uh, introducing a perturbation. Um, now let us see, I take a sample, okay, a cuvette and then uh, shine some light and then ask um, and then I can actually measure how much of the light is, uh, so let us call that as I0 and I can measure how much of the light is actually uh, coming out, so I t. So, <coughs> I am interested in knowing how much of this incident light will be absorbed by this molecule or if the molecule, I mean or for that matter if the molecule even will absorb and if it is absorbing how much of the light it is going to absorb. Now, how do we approach this? Um, we know the rate of transition. So, given an incident light of uh, a frequency and an intensity, uh, what kind of transition, I mean what is the rate of transition that we expect. Now, the frequency is clearly uh, coming in uh, here in to, uh, through omega term. However, uh, where is the intensity? Now, if you look, look back at the rate of transition, um, you <coughs> uh, what we have done is that uh, we have we made a dipolar approximation and then we introduce this uh, please remember we introduce this um, the electric field right. Now, all of that is being observed inside that uh, uh, constant k. So, I am going to um, specifically write it out. So, rate of transition here uh, would correspond to uh, my experimentally observed change in the li um, light intensity right. So, I can write it as the rate at which the light intensity is changing di by dt that is correspond that corresponds to my the rate of transition which is some k prime times modulo e naught square modulus r k g times rho k g and so forth. So, now <coughs> this uh, epsilon naught square is proportional to the intensity. So, we can explicitly put that uh, because um, this is the light intensity that is the amplitude E naught is the amplitude of the E field in our electromagnetic radiation right. in our perturbation. So, um, in such a case uh, what we can actually do is we can rearrange this whole term in terms of d i by d t is k r k g 
omega kg times the intensity. So, now <coughs> um, only the intensity is time dependent and the rest everything is uh, constant with respect to time. So, you can rearrange this into a differential form that we know of which is d i by i equals k prime r k g square rho omega k g and um, into d t. Now, if we solve for it, we will see that uh, and then uh, use the initial conditions as we have seen that to start with the at t equal to 0, the intensity of the light is represented by i 0. So, we can say it is ln of uh, i by i 0 equals minus k this modulus r k g square t. Okay. Or in other words k r k g modulus square t the concentration of the substance Um, we need uh, the concentration comes into picture here because if you actually look at the experiment, what we are uh, what we need to know is this is the molecular transition rate. So we need to know how many number of molecules the light encounters um, in its path, and if you actually uh, uh, for uh, for us to do that. Uh, the intensity is the number of photons per unit area. So, uh, if you uh, take away the area then I mean to um, if you multiply that by the concentration uh, what you have is this um, and then of, um, this also a molar uh, absorption cross section. So, we have to also um, express it in molar uh, concentration. So, that we uh, re I mean re relate them to the number of molecules um, in the system. If you do that then what we have is uh, this expression. Now, here the T is basically the time sp uh, the light spends interacting with the sample. So, that is given by <coughs> the let us L be the path length of the cuvet okay. L be the path length of the cuvet then um, what we are going to do here is to obtain T, T is the interaction time right. Um, so, interaction time we are going to calculate as T then is given by the time taken by the light to traverse the distance L right. So, <coughs> this will be L divided by C uh, gives you the T. So, that we can actually uh, plug it in in the above expression. So, we have absorbance is given by k r k g times L the path length times the molar concentration 
by uh, c is the velocity of light. So, I am um, collecting them with the constants. Now, this is nothing but your Beer Bayer Lambert's law, Lambert Bayer's law or Bayer Lambert's law. I repeat. So, what we have done here is that we said <coughs> I am going to write down the an expression for the rate of transitions. I took this rate, then recognized that this is a molecular rate uh, <coughs> constant. So, in order for me to actually um, uh, represent the true absorbents, I need to do few things. One is to introduce the um, absor absorbents is for a uh, it is a molar um, substance, one mole of a substance. We multiplied this by the molar concentration. Uh, concentration is basically expressed in terms of molar concentration is, is defined as the number of moles of a substance per unit volume. The volume here is important because uh, we have to est we need to know uh, the number of molecules that the uh, light is interacting with. So, that uh, is really given by um, this molar concentration and then we replace the time, the time of interaction um, by the path length using the relationship that uh, the light gets to interact with the molecule as long as it is traveling inside the cuvette. Given that L is the path length of the cuvette, C is the velocity uh, with which the light is traveling. So, we can say T is L by C. Now, put that in you have K by C um, the, the familiar expression right. So, K by C R K G um, modulus square L times the concentration. I claim this to be the Bayer Lambert's law, wherein you have the path length dependence in terms of the L, concentration dependence in terms of direct concentration itself, and the epsilon, the molecular, the, the, uh, it, it is a molar extinction coefficient. That is, the probability that the molecule will absorb a given wavelength of light is given by this right because this is totally determined by the molecular property or kg is a molecular property given a given a molecule you define what is g i mean what is eg and what is ek as a result uh, modulus or kg is a molecular property and then um, you can think of this as epsilon so and hence you are familiar thing of epsilon C L, where C here uh, should not be confused. Let us uh, put this. The capital C here is really the molar concentration and not the uh, velocity C. So, now in going through this, uh, uh, this elaborate process of describing the light matter interaction using a framework of quantum mechanics, what we have done is that we have um, arrived at few important um, conclusions or few important findings, which to start with uh, we do, we would not have been able to uh, we would not known. One is to say that <coughs> rate of transition of a given pro, uh, of a process, rate of transition between two uh, energy states because of a perturbation is directly proportional to the matrix element defined by this energy modulus square of the matrix element. The matrix element here itself is defined by the initial and the final energy kits and the operator corresponding to the perturbation ok. That is our R modulus R k g square ok. So, that determines the rate of the transition since it goes as modulus square, uh, we also said 
the same perturbation can take or can uh, mediate the transition from once I mean the um, lower energy state to the higher energy state or the higher energy state to the lower energy state with equal probability because it is if you uh, flip the things it does not matter because it is modulus, modulus square is exactly the same in magnitude you are only looking at the magnitude and the magnitude is um, exactly the same as a result we predicted that the same light that can cause the absorption um, and the result in the transition of the molecule from the ground state to the excited state can also take the molecule if it were to be to start with in the excited state to the ground state with equal probability. After that we said hey if this were to represent the uh, rate process rate of a transition experimentally in a laboratory we measure the we, uh, we, we measure something called as an absorbance in a spectrometer that is uh, I take a cuvette shine the light and then ask how much of the light is actually uh, being absorbed by the molecule this is really what I am um, of, uh, the, of my interest as a spectroscopist right. I want to know uh, if I shine a particular light what is the probability of that transition happening. Now that uh, I should be able to predict the way we did that is to recognize the fact uh, the rate of the transition is for a particular wavelength omega and if you, since we are taking a broad um, broadband excitation you could actually use uh, you could integrate this rate over this entire uh, spectrum accounting for the fact that there could be um, different uh, states the pro, um, um, slightly uh, states with slightly different energy levels present around the E k state the final state. So, let us account for that and if you do this then uh, what we have is an expression we termed as the Fermi's golden rule that tells you that um, uh, the probability of occurrence of the transition in such situations and we said now let us um, uh, equate it to the difference in the intensity that we would see because the rate of transition should correspond to a correspond I mean correspond to the um, amount of light that get absorbed by the molecule if that is true let us write down the expression and uh, the differential expression that describes this process we wrote down and solved for it and then what we have gotten uh, is reminiscent of the bare lambert's law or to be to be more, more i mean it's really the bare lambert's law and then uh, uh, what i would like to say is what has been derived empirically by these two scientists we are able to relate it from the fundamental principles of quantum i mean uh, uh, to an expression that we derive for the rate of transition from the fundamental principles of quantum mechanics now, this is good, nice. <coughs> we have way, we have a way of understanding the process of absorption. Our framework really allows us to understand this. In the process, it also predicted that there will be stimulated emission. This what we have uh, we have obtained using what is called as a semi classical picture. we still treated the light uh, the perturbation I mean until the perturbation it is fully quantum mechanical no problem at all, but the when we the moment we put the perturbation as uh, E naught uh, sin I mean uh, a sinusoidal uh, uh, electromagnetic wave uh, then that is a classical treatment of the light with the quantum mechanical treatment of the atom. So, that is why we call it as semi classical treatment or semi classical picture. Albert Einstein was uh, equally interested in understanding these transitions 
but he approached it in a totally phenomenological manner. In fact, uh, he argued that there is something more in uh, more intrinsic uh, that has to be uh, uh, that has to be understood beyond this absorption and stimulated emission and he that did that uh, through totally phenomenological means. What do I mean by this? Let us take a look at um, his approach and his description of this whole uh, process and then see what um, he predicted. Okay. He argued, hey look we know um, thanks to Boltzmann that if you take a system, um, um, a system of chromophores and then let us say if we let it equilibrate, let it equilibrate with a black body that is kept close to it. Meaning, that, uh, if you keep them, I mean, due, um, uh, due, um, if you keep them close to each other, then you can think of a uh, thermal equilibrium that has been set in between the system that we are probing and the black body itself. And in such a case, Boltzmann predicted the population of um, the molecules in different energy states. Okay. So, so uh, what we are doing now here is the phenomenological um, approach. So, I am going to call it as phi now. treatment of this process or wherein we still have these energy states right. The molecule we have the molecules and they have this different energy states and you can call it as E g be, being the lower energy E 1 so on uh, in general E k. What Boltzmann uh, tells us, uh, Boltzmann um, tells us is that if you were to actually write down an expression for <coughs> the number of molecules that are present <coughs> in um, each of these levels, then they should be following a particular, they should be following a distribution. And this distribution um, would be given by N2 or by <coughs> N1 equals E minus E2 minus E1 whole divided by K absolute temperature, okay, where in <coughs> Ni is the number of molecules or in other ways you can think of that as the occupancy of the state, number of molecules in the energy state E1. Okay. So, now <coughs> if you just uh, let us start I mean uh, um, to make it make things uh, easier for us to understand, but it is easy uh, you can easily generalize. You can think of a two level system just like our K and G then this whole expression can be written as <coughs> E n k by n g equals e to the power minus delta E k g divided by 
k capital T, where k this is Boltzmann's constant. <clears throat> this being the case, this being the case, you can see <clears throat> even if the temperature T, right, the capital T, so T is the absolute temperature, in Kelvin scale, right. Okay. So, even if the T capital T goes to infinity, <coughs> making this whole term equal to 0, N k can at the most become equal to N g in all other at T is um, T equals infinity. As you keep increasing the temperature, um, <coughs> the N k keeps going up. We have to understand, we have, we have to, um, I have to tell you that uh, since it is a two level um, system, the N total, right, that is a fixed, the fixed number of uh, molecules that we are taking with is given by N g plus N k. So, which means uh, to start with, right? To start with, you have a certain number of ground state molecules and the NK and certain number of excited state molecules. Depending on the energy gap between them, it, um, it can be very small to almost negligible. Nothing is there at all. Um, <coughs> however, um, uh, irrespective of wherever you start with, as the temperature goes up the population I mean that this fraction is go slowly going to increase, but it will increase towards reaching 1 this fraction will uh, inch towards reaching 1 that means, the N k st starting anyway lower from g can approach as close to uh, N g as possible um, <coughs> when the temperature is um, uh, temperature is uh, at infinity, which practically uh, means that you are not going to um, be there at all for um, any meaningful, I mean uh, for uh, whether you will see that or not very much depends on the uh, how big is the delta E, right. Infinity here of temperature is in comparison with delta E, okay. So, if uh, T is capital T is sufficiently large with respect to V, then only you will see it. That is the meaning of the statement. That immediately uh, told um, Einstein that, hey, I know that the molecular transition rate given by Fermi's golden rule for going from G to K or K to G is exactly the same. Okay. So, that corresponds to the rate constant being exactly the same at a given um, um, <coughs> intensity of the perturbation, right? intensity of the light, electromagnetic light. But still here I have, I am, ha I have a system which is a thermal equilibrium because basically meaning whatever the population that is present here uh, are not uh, changing as a function of time. I am looking at the um, <coughs> number of molecules present in the ground state and then number of molecules that are present in the excited state. They see uh, when they reach the thermal equilibrium that is all it means that the numbers are steady. They are not they reach the steady state. They are not um, changing. They, they may fluctuate here and there, but they were on uh, average remain uh, the same and yet this being lower the excited state number is still lower. The only reason, only way that is possible is that there should be another path or another another way that the molecule can come down from the excited state to the ground state, a leak 
uh, in the system that needs to exist such that this can remain lower. Otherwise, see the uh, if um, these the molecular rates are uh, equal uh, equal then <coughs> the, the steady state would be at steady state you would expect the numbers to be equal to. The fact that we know that it is not the uh, it is not equal means that there is a leak and he called this leak as spontaneous emission. That is an emission process that is not dependent on the presence of light. If the light were to modulate right, so the light uh, if the light intensity were to modulate this ray it depends on that then <coughs> we know that already that, that that rate a stimulated emission rate is exactly equivalent to the absorption rate too. So, that is not sufficient we need to have another term that is a leak uh, term that is not dependent on the light. So, that is that is the key here that term he called it as spontaneous emission. Now, this whole thing can be nicely um, uh, um, uh, set in terms of the chemical uh, you can think of this as a uh, chemical reaction and then uh, write in we can write down the rates of these processes. The idea being we were we are interested in this spontaneous emission if it were to be spontaneous emission I would like to know what determines it. How is it related to the absorption and the emission and the, and the emission process that is um, caused by the light itself. To obtain this um, is very easy. So, what uh, we are going to do is that we are going to do the number balancing. So, let us uh, expand this um, rate uh, energy state diagram. So, ok. So, the where I can actually mark down my uh, rate processes. So, we will say the number of molecules in the ground state is n g and the number in the excited state the S k is n k. Now, this is the ab, uh, absorption process ok. Now, we know this is uh, proportional to r k g modulus square and same thing also happening here or oh, sorry not the wiggly wheel, but the crossed one the spontaneous it has been 35 minutes. Uh, constant yes the spontaneous uh, rate constant um, let us call it as he called it as a k g he called these ones the stimulated ones as B k g. So, they are famously called as Einstein's A and B coefficients. In the next class what we will see is that how using this uh, simple um, diagram and the balancing of the rates he obtained an expression for a k g the spontaneous emission rate constant in terms of um, the stimulated emission um, which we can ex we know can express can be expressed in terms of the molecular properties ok I will see you in the next class.